Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for our meditation this morning, Isaiah chapter 63, beginning at verse 15. Look down from heaven and see, from your holy and beautiful habitation. Where are your zeal and your might? The stirring of your inner parts and your compassion are held back from me. For you are our Father. Though Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not acknowledge us, O Lord, you are our Father. Our Redeemer from of old is your name. O Lord, why do you make us wander from your ways and harden our heart so that we fear you not? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Your holy people held possession for a little while. Our adversaries have trampled down your sanctuary. We have become like those over whom you have never ruled like those who are not called by your name. This is our text. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're talking in this series about lament, the lament of God's people of old, specifically as seen in Isaiah 63, 64, 65, but also about how lament is still a part of our lives as God's people today. In the first of these sermons, we saw judgment declared upon the wayward people of God in the vivid picture of the warrior God stained with the blood of his enemies. The comfort in this is that we have a God who's willing to enact vengeance upon our persecutors and those who abuse us. It's not a pretty picture but neither is the suffering of God's people at the hands of their enemies. God will avenge us, and this is to our advantage, even if in the process collateral damage occurs and we get caught up in the fray. Last week we saw the harsh judgment of God defended by a recounting of the mighty acts of God for his people, especially through his servant Moses, and by a reminder that for all his faithfulness, his people repaid him with faithless rebellion. Now, after Isaiah has spoken about God and the history of his rebellious people, the prophet begins to talk to God and to petition him to involve himself in the affairs of his people. Has the thought ever occurred to you, where is God? Certainly, God's people in our text were thinking this. Where is Yahweh? Where is your zeal, O God? Look down from heaven your beautiful habitation, and see what is happening to us. And then they start to recall. In the old days, you used to help us. You used to be with us. You used to care about us. What happened to that? You gave us our own land for a little while. Okay, 800 years, but who's counting? Now it feels like we've been a people over whom you never ruled, like you never had anything to do with us. Their complaint is that God has become to them Deus absconditus, the hidden God. So Isaiah appeals to God to turn and make his presence known again. He says, you are our father. Abraham doesn't know us. Israel doesn't recognize us. They look at us and say, who are you? And whose are you? 
They don't even acknowledge that we're your people. And it's true, they didn't look like the faithful Israelites of old. They had drifted so far from the true faith that it didn't even appear as though they were the people of God anymore. And you will, when you look at their perennial proclivity toward idolatry and apostasy, you'd be fair to wonder if a good chunk of them had even ever been in a genuine relationship with God in the first place. But whose fault was that? Well, this is where it gets interesting. Isaiah's lament takes a bold turn in verse 17, and he starts accusing God of causing Israel's waywardness and hard-heartedness. Why would you make us wander from your ways, O Lord? Why would you hearten our hearts so that we don't believe in you or fear you? Wouldn't God find greater pleasure in restoring his people? Isaiah wonders. Now, he has just confessed the rebellious nature of these people. He's acknowledged that they often deliberately frustrate their father's hopes and expectations. How does he now summon the audacity to blame God for the way they are? Some folks have criticized God for his dealings with Pharaoh, especially when they read in the book of Exodus that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But really, all God was doing was confirming Pharaoh in his own sin. And as for Pharaoh, so for the Israelites of Isaiah's day, God's judgment was to confirm them in their apostasy. It's as though he was saying, look, if, if that's how you want it, if you want to run off and rebel, reject my law, reject me, so be it. I won't stop you. In fact, I'll help you get there. And so God simply affirms what he knew they were going to do anyway. Listen, unbelief hardens hearts. It reduces a person's ability to hear and respond to the gospel. God is exceedingly patient with the rebellious and longs for them to repent and return to him. But there comes a time when he says, enough's enough, and he hands people over to their unbelief. He says as much through the Apostle Paul in Romans 1. Oh, that we would humbly heed his warning not to harden our hearts, but to repent and cling to the forgiveness we receive in the gospel. Look, we're no different than God's people of old. We have the same tendency to rebel and run away and do our own thing. All of us were born with a sinful nature inherited from Adam, and we have this natural inclination to wander off like sheep without a shepherd. And believe me, you're not going to be able to fight it by looking inwardly and trying to muster up some kind of power from within yourself to combat it. Your only hope is to look outside of yourself to the one true shepherd. Isaiah's challenge to God is really a cry for help, an attempt to persuade God to turn and rescue his people, which we know he did in ultimately sending his son as the suffering servant who bore our sins and diseases, who carried the punishment for our sins to the cross of Calvary. In Jesus, the Deus absconditus, becomes the Deus Revelatus. The hidden God has become the revealed God. Jesus came, 
not to know us better, but that we could know him better, to see God in the flesh, to look upon his face and live. In him we have life, forgiveness of sins, and everlasting salvation. And not only this, now we have a better answer to the question, where is God? Years ago, there was a, a young woman in my congregation who struggled with depression. Her dad had it. Her mom had it. And Christine seemed to have a double portion of it. Most of the time, it was well controlled by medication. But then she got pregnant. She and her husband knew this would be challenging, but their desire for a child overruled their concern for Chris's emotional well-being. She can do without the meds for nine months, they reasoned. And for the most part, she did. In due time, the baby came, a bouncing baby boy, which they named David, who, by the way, is in college now. One day, as I was on my way home from visiting a shut-in in a nearby town, I uh, had recently gotten my first ever cell phone, you know, the kind that used to bolt into your car. Now you can't even use your cell phone in your car. But anyway, the phone rings, and it's Christine. Where's God, she demanded. And before I could pull together a response, she continued, He promised he would never leave me nor forsake me, but I, I don't feel him. I have no idea where he is. Pastor, where's God? I said, I'll be right there. I hung up the phone and I started to pray. Lord, you better give me something, because she's going to want an answer by the time I get there. Now, I've never heard the voice of God, but I had the distinct impression of what I was to do. I drove to Chris's house, and we sat and talked for a little bit. She explained that even though she was back on her medication, the postpartum depression was almost unbearable. And I listened quietly for a time, which, you know, is hard for a preacher. But when she was finished, I said, Chris, you asked me where God is. And you're right when you say that he has promised never to leave you nor forsake you. He's given us a very real very tangible way to know that he's with us. He doesn't make us depend upon our feelings. I brought Holy Communion with me. And if in a few minutes, you're going to take the Lord's very body and blood into your own body. And as has happened many times before, he will become one with you, and you with him. We then shared the sacrament together, and her husband told me later that she began that day to come out of the deep hole that she had found herself in. Beloved, when you find yourself staring down a long, dark tunnel, and you're wondering where God is. When it looks like he's abandoned you and you start to question whether you were ever his child to begin with. When it feels like your enemies are having a field day with you and you have no hope for survival. Be reminded that you know where God is. You know that you can always find him where he has promised to be, in his word and in his sacraments. For he is our father, but not just our father. He is also our redeemer. 
And he returns to us wherever and whenever his word is read, spoken, preached, and his holy supper is celebrated. Beloved, look for him in his means of grace, and you will never be disappointed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.